Hi, I am Mark Post from the Netherlands here at Maastricht University and I'm the inventor of Cultured Beef, produced our first hamburger from stem cells in 2013. Um, I'm very um, grateful to Createc to have invited me to uh, give this lecture to you and I'm, I'm very, very sorry I cannot attend your beautiful city and your conference in person uh, because I have obligations um, elsewhere in the world. Um, I hope you will uh, enjoy the presentation um, and the rest of the conference. Well, we mean with uh, cultured meat that we culture meat from stem cells, basically making exactly the same product as you get from a cow, but now only with the cells from a cow and not the animal um, as, a, as a whole. So we take cells from the cow, stem cells, we let them proliferate, let them divide, um, and let them make tissue, which they can do inside of our body when they repair our muscle tissue, but we can also take them out and get them in the lab and let them do exactly the same thing. So they make muscle tissue in a Petri dish in the absence of the cow. Well, cultured meat is a product which is meat, but grown in a different way. Um, and we're doing this because um, there's an increasing demand for meat worldwide, um, about 70% increase in 2050. And there's no way that we can um, manage that with livestock. That's one uh, important reason. So we need to find other ways to produce meat. In addition, we, know, we now know that meat production through livestock is associated with greenhouse gas emission. Um, 20%, 15 to 20 percent of all greenhouse gas emission actually comes from the livestock industry. And in order to prevent or, or revert climate change, we need to work on that as well. Um, and the third reason is, my guess is that there is an increasing um, problem that consumers have with animal welfare in livestock uh, production and uh, that's something that we need to be concerned of because eventually that will turn against uh, meat um, as we know it right now so also that is an additional reason to work on alternatives. <laughs> Right, so the, the process is very simple. You take a muscle from a cow, a small piece of muscle, maybe only one gram through a biopsy. You get all the stem cells out of there and you let them proliferate. Obviously, you need to feed these cells. So you need to feed them with amino acids, with sugars, with minerals, uh, with vitamins. Uh, those come from plants. They are plant-based or bacteria-based. You need to feed the cells, then the cells start to divide and proliferate. Uh, and at some point, when you put them in a temporary gel, um, you can let them make muscle tissue. Still very small pieces, so for a um, processed meat, like a hamburger, that's fine. For a whole steak, we need a slightly different technology. Um, and once we have that, once we have those pieces of tissue, you can make a patty out of this and you have a hamburger, which uses less resources, um, uses less animals, and is associated with less greenhouse gas emission. But you still need to feed it. The problem with, especially with cows, is that they are very inefficient in converting vegetable proteins in their feed or food to animal proteins. So we need to feed the animal a lot of material um, in order to get a little bit of protein out of it. And with this process, we can, we can make that a better process. We can make it more efficient so that less resources are needed to produce the same amount of meat. Right, benefits of cultured meat should be obvious, I think. Um, we use less resources and we have less greenhouse gas emission and we use less animals to produce meat. The question obviously is, especially in Argentina where you have such beautiful meats, <laughs> whether we can create that same quality, uh, whether it can satisfy the craving of people, of consumers, to, for meat. That's the, that's the big question, and that's what we need to strive at, that we can indeed satisfy that need. If we're able to do that at a, at a reasonable price, um, then I think it has a lot of societal benefits. Um, uh, obviously, challenges are many. Uh, we need to build an entire new industry. 
um, that's not going to happen overnight. That's going to take decades because there's a lot of meat being produced and consumed and that, and that has to increase. So um, it's going to take a long time and a lot of additional investments to get that industry going. Uh, one of the other challenges obviously is to get people used to the idea that this is something that no longer comes directly from a cow but sort of indirectly from a cow through um, a process that happens in a laboratory or in a factory. That also requires time. It, in the beginning it's unknown, people will not know whether it's safe, they may not immediately trust it, so we need to develop that trust and need consumers to be happy with uh, those products. And again, it is going to be a challenge to create those wonderful uh, steaks. Yeah, we don't really have a, uh, a vision on that. Um, we probably are going to produce or license the production of a commodity, basically the raw material of meat. And then meat processors will eventually distribute it in, uh, in any way they want. Um, the scale of the whole thing can be such that this can be a community-based um, production system, even in a small farm, in a small village, or in the middle of a desert, if you like. So it can be at very, very small scale. Um, you know, common sense kind of dictates, if you look at how food is being produced now, that the whole scale eventually will be used. There will be small artisanal production systems, um, more community based, but there will also be large companies that will do this very cost effectively, very effective, effective in a way of large volumes, distribu distributing channels. So I'm, I think that probably the entire gamut of um, scale will be materialized uh, in the end. Well, so currently there are four companies working on this worldwide. Um, one in California, one in Korea, one in Israel and, and our company. Um, those are still very small companies and uh, they have to do a lot of research. So we envision that in three years it will be on the market uh, but still in restaurants and maybe in specialty stores. Um, in order for it to be a supermarket product, the price has to come down to regular levels, um, and that requires another two, three years. So I think between four and seven years, we will see it, probably more like seven years, we will see it in supermarkets. Yeah, I mean, this is, what you could call a disruptive technology. It's going to change, um, if, if this flies, it's going to change um, an entire industry from livestock to a more technical based um, industry. So that means that a lot of livestock farming, um, and again, if this is going to happen, a lot of livestock farming will, will change or will disappear. Um, for farmers themselves, I think this is a big opportunity to uh, to move from livestock to crops and to move to a different form of farming. We see that happening everywhere. Um, in the Netherlands there's hardly any small-scale livestock farming left. Um, they all move to crops because it, they cannot make money anymore. Um, and, and, and as I said, this will take decades um, for this entire industry to develop. So people have time to think about what I'm going to do with my farm, um, how am I going to change my production system? Um, will I focus on still the very high-end livestock uh, that um, will be longer in the marketplace or a high-end livestock that will provide the stem cells for this type of work? So people have time to adapt. Um, but yeah, an adaptation is required um, at some point, which for every new technology basically is the same. I mean, my job as a teacher can be taken over by video games. And so I will need to think about how I'm going to change my job in the future when, when my regular teaching um, jobs are replaced by video games. Um, I think so. I think um, uh, traditional artisanal meat production through livestock will, will probably still have a place 
much smaller, I believe, than it is right now, but for really high-end uh, gourmet type of um, uh, environments. Um, I think the, the, the bread and butter of meat production will change, will change to a commodity that is much more friendly for the environment, much more friendly for animals, and uh, above all, uh, resource efficient. Um, well, there's no question that there will be new meat consumers. That's predicted by the World Health Organization. In 2050, we will, be ha we will have 70% more meat consumers than we have right now. Because we go from 7 to 9 billion people, and people in India and China become richer so that they can afford meat. So meat consumption will go up. That seems like, a, like good news for meat producers. Um, but in effect, it's not, because through livestock, and I've traveled over uh, the entire world, and I don't see places, maybe with the exception of Argentina, where meat production actually can increase tremendously. Um, so there's no way we can accommodate that. Um, will it tap into new um, uh, uh, consumers? Yes, I guess so. I guess for very specific vegetarians who are not eating meat because solely of animal welfare issues, they might be enticed to start eating meat. I've certainly talked to some of them. Uh, but there are many other vegetarians who say, well, you know, I, I don't like meat uh, and I don't think it's necessary, so why would I? Um, hopefully, um, also, the price of this will come down to a level where it's affordable for everybody. Um, and even affordable for people who cannot afford meat right now. And then, it, yes, it will increase volume, which is not necessarily a problem once you can produce it in a resource-efficient manner.